Hi boys and girls, this is Mrs. P and I'm gonna see what this book is about. It's, I'm sorry there's a glare. It began with a page and it's written by, or it says, how Gio Fujikawa drew the way. And I don't know what it's about. And it was written by Kayo McClear and probably illustrations by Julie Morstad. Let's look and see in the front. Oh, okay. Gio Fujikawa drew pictures. Her parents had come to California from Japan looking for a better life, but sometimes Gio felt invisible. When high school came, Gio's teachers recognized her gift for creating beautiful art and got behind her. Okay, so um, this means... Um, so, let's see. Let's find out what this book is about. It began with a page. How Gio Fukijawa, Fujikawa drew the way. Pictures by Julie Morstead. Words by Kyron Clear. It began with a page, bright and beckoning. It began with a mother writing a poem and a father working in a field, or working a field, and a little girl named Gio drawing a picture. It was 1913 and Gio was five years old. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm not positive. And so here she is. That morning, her mama said, Ohio, sleepyhead, it's going to be a busy day. And it was. Right until nightfall, mama's friends had come and they were full of talk. Oh, we sailed to America with our best kimono to see what could, what we could be. It's, it's all a bunch of ladies. Such disappointment. We need the vote. We need rights. And Gio held her rice bowl and listened with curious ears. Did Gio know what she wanted to be? Not yet. Right now, she's just a little girl listening to the older ladies talk. What she did know was that she liked to draw. She loved the feel of the pencil in her hand, the dance and the glide of a line, how a new color could change everything, a bright splash of yellow or a sleepy stroke of blue. Every day, she started with an empty white page and filled it with pictures. At home, surrounded by drawing tools and books, anything was possible. But at school, Gio didn't feel that way. At school, no one said, boy, that girl sure can draw. No one noticed her colored pencils or box of paints. No one even noticed when she moved away. Oh. Gio's new home was a fishing village na near San Pedro, California, a haven for Japanese Americans, a new life. Roaming with her friends, Gio felt weightless and free. A ferry ride away at her high school, Gio sometimes still felt invisible among her mostly white classmates. But her drawings caught the attention of two teachers. Who was this girl whose eyes missed nothing? Who could sketch rivers and boats and birds like a dream? Miss Cole and Miss Bloom saw the energy in each line of her drawings. Gio was too poor to go to art school, but Miss Cole found money to pay her way.
Jill was nervous to leave her home for the buzz and the bustle of downtown Los Angeles. Not many girls, and even fewer Asian American girls, went to college in 1926, but Gio was determined. She sketched statues and flowers and faces. Her sketchbook is filled up one after another. No, oh, look, they're drawing an image, um, I think, of the Statue of Liberty. And here she is by herself. And all the men are over here drawing. Hungry to know more, Gio sent off for Japan in the land of her ancestors to study traditional Japanese brush painting. But the teachers were full of rules. Hold your pen like that. Hold your pen like that. Instead, she traveled around the country doing her, learn, her own learning. Wood blocks, carving tools, inks made out of soot. She lost herself in the Prince of Hiroshiga, Utamaro Hokus, Hokusai. Gosh, I probably murdered those names. and floated in a beautiful sea of kimono. Travel fed her dreams, but back in America, it was time to earn money. For the next few years, Gia worked long days, painting murals and drawing for magazines. In 1941, she was offered a temporary job designing books at Walt Disney Studio in New York, a city filled with arts and artists. It was hard for Gio to leave her family, especially her mother. Little did she know that things were about to get harder still. In early 1942, terrible things were happening. Bombs and gunfire rocked the world. America was at war with Japan. Gio was shocked to discover that anyone who looked Japanese or had a Japanese name was now suspected of being the enemy. Japanese Americans living on the West Coast were ordered to leave their homes, their schools, their pets, everything. Gio, along with others living on the East Coast, was told to stay where she was. On the West Coast, families preparing to leave tried to sell their larger, larger belongings, like cars and furniture, to junk dealers, but they were offered only pennies. I won't sell, said Gio's mother. You. That's her, that's her mother's name, you. Instead, she set everything on fire. Gio's family was sent to a prison camp far, far away from their home, and Gio's heart was broken. So, okay, so here they are looking for where they're going to sleep, and there's a guard up in a tower watching. For the next three years, the world shrank, became tiny and terrible. Now, when she gazed at a white page, no pictures would come. Gio mailed her family letters and sent gifts to her nephew born in the camp, but her heart just would not mend. Eventually, Gio began to draw again. She drew to keep her worries still and to save money her family would need. When angry strangers saw her as the enemy, drawing comforted her. But 
When the world felt gray, color lifted her. She wondered, could art comfort and lift others too? When the war ended, the Fujikawas were released. With no house or savings to call their own, they had to start again. For Gio, the next 15 years passed swiftly. There were stamps to create, store windows to decorate, a children's book of poetry to illustrate. There were two poodles who needed loving. Now, when Gio walked around the city collecting ideas for her pictures, she began to notice little changes around her. Still, there was much that hadn't changed. At the library and bookshop, it was the same old stories. Mothers in aprons and fathers with pipes in a world of only white children. Gio knew, knew a book that could hold more and do more. A book, she told her poodles, can be anything that anyone imagines them to be. Gio knew what she wanted to do. Every day, she started with an empty page and filled it with pictures and words. When her book was done, she gave it to a publisher. And what did they see? Oh, look, they saw babies and kitties and little toddlers. Babies, chubby-cheeked and squat-legged, bouncy-bottomed babies, naughty, nice, oh-so-busy, toddler-crawling babies. But the pub publisher said no. No to mixing white babies and black babies. It was not done in the early 1960s America, a country with laws that separated people by skin color. But Gio would not budge. She closed her eyes and remembered all the times she had felt unseen and unwelcome. She looked at the publisher. She looked the publisher in the eye and said, "It shouldn't be that way. Not out there in the streets. Not here on this page. We need to break the rules." And that is her telling them, and she's thinking about these babies that she's talking about. And then she waited for them to rethink their decision. The babies waited too, and waited. But babies cannot wait. Finally, the publisher said yes, and the book did well, very well. Babies loved it, so Gio kept going. Welcoming kids in from the edges, from the corners, from the shadows, Gio let each child find a place. Girls and boys freed from pink or blue, sharing jokes, joys, mishaps, bruises, all sprawling across the bright page, ready for a bigger, better world. And that is the end of the story. And it says, a note from the author and the illustrator. So I'll just read just this one piece. It began with a question. Who was Gio Fujikawa? We both loved Gio's wonderful books, but knew so little about their creator. We were full of questions, so we set out to find out more and correct some of the muddled information circulating on the Internet. She was... She made books, postage stamps, window art, murals, greeting cards, magazine covers, and built a celebrated career that spanned more than four decades in an industry that wasn't always welcoming to single women, not to mention those of Japanese-American ancestry. So, she was a rule breaker and a trailblazer. And in her first book called Babies, she proposed showing an international set of babies. Little black babies, Asian babies, all kinds of babies. Huh. Good thing. Good thing. And here is a picture of her and her dogs. And she says, because I'm an artist myself, she continues to be an inspiration in my life. I am amazed to be related to such an amazing woman. To me, she had such a subtle and graceful yet commanding presence, something I, as a child, could easily sense. 
and that is from Danny Fujikawa, songwriter and Gio's great nephew. So, there we go. I'm going to have to look for more of her books. Bye.